Okay, well, welcome. Um, thanks for joining us for this for this webcast. My name's Paul Ryan, and together with Elon Enforskowski, who's in Stockholm, and I'm in Australia, um, we're going to be tag teaming through this session. We were expecting about 50 people, uh, and at the moment we've got about five. So I'm not exactly sure what's happened, whether people haven't um, logged on yet or whether we're not seeing who else has logged on. But anyway, we'll make a start and people can join us as we go. Um, the process will be, we'll have just some introductory comments from myself and a little bit of background, a bit of context about the Wayfinder approach. Then we'll go into quite a, a detailed sort of step through the, the Wayfinder platform that um, Elon will talk us through. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end for, for questions. And I'm not sure whether people are familiar with go to meeting the, the control panel, but you'll see down the bottom there's a little chat box. Um, so if you've got a question, just type your question in there and I'll keep track of those. Um, and then we'll, we'll work through those at the end. So you can log those as we go if you'd like or wait till the end um, either way. And we'll keep track of those questions and hopefully we'll have plenty of time for that discussion at the end. So just a little bit of context about Wayfinder and its origin. So where, where does it come from? Wayfinder is a, uh, a platform, uh, an online platform for uh, thinking about and for uh, assessing and managing resilience towards sustainable futures. And we'll go into a bit more about the framing of that in a minute. Um, but the, the uh, platform itself has been produced by a team at the Stockholm Resilience Centre. Um, myself and Elin, as well as uh, Alison Quinlan from the Resilience Alliance. So they're the sort of three key partners. Uh, and then we're supported by uh, a number of staff at the Stockholm Resilience Centre. The Wayfinder itself is a, is a product of the GRADE program. And I'd suggest if you're interested in um, looking at resilience and development uh, issues that you go to the Stockholm Resilience Centre website and you look at the GRADE program, there's a number of activities, including a, an online MOOC. Uh, there's been a lot of synthesis work, um, popular articles in the Rethink magazine, a whole, whole range of things. So if you're interested in what more detail, I'd suggest that you go to the Stockholm Resilience Centre website and look for the GRADE program uh, and have a look at the detail there. Why do we need an approach like Wayfinder? And I guess we've been interested um, for a long time in resilience assessment and how do you take the ideas, the concepts, the theory of resilience and turn it into practice? And, and all of us know, um, I'm sure everyone listening knows the sort of global interest in resilience. It's become a, a major um, sort of an approach in development, in um, finance, in um, um, climate uh, change and climate management. All sorts of areas are interested in resilience. We're particularly interested in how you take those ideas and turn them into practice. And, and Wayfinder is an attempt to do that. It's our, our attempt to bring all of that um, cutting edge science around resilience together into a process that, that people are interested in trying to make change in their system who want to navigate towards sustainable futures can use to guide them through uh, a series of phases. And Elin will talk about those phases in detail in a minute. Um, and it's a way to, to step through a process that brings that science together with practice um, to deliver outputs that um, we believe help you to target the, the right places uh, with the right types of interventions to create the sort of change that we'd like to see towards a fair, just and sustainable future. So it's a it's a an, an attempt to bring all that together into a, a single sort of process. We need to acknowledge a couple of really important things. One is that we're building on a very long history. So um, resilience assessment's not new. There's been the Resilience Alliance workbook, which was first produced in 2007 has been a, um, a major uh, 
reference, if you like, for people all around the world. It's been used um, by thousands of people to, to think about and explore resilience in their systems. It's been translated into a number of different languages. Um, and so we've been, we've built on that guide. We've used um, a number of the sort of concepts and ideas out of that, but also added to it in a, in a fairly substantial way, particularly around practice. So the Resilience Alliance workbook, the first workbook was very much focused on the concepts, on the theory, if you like, um, and, and how to apply that theory. We've taken that, um, a lot of those ideas, that concepts, those concepts and taken them further, but also placed them in the context of this um, more significant kind of process guide. So, um, but also there's been lots of other approaches to resilience uh, assessment out there and used by a range of organisations right around the, the planet. I guess we've tried to review those, we've tried to look at the strengths and weaknesses of those different approaches uh, and tried to bring together um, the best of those um, different approaches and draw on those where we can, uh, as well as draw on our own theory and our own uh, practice and experience and tried to pull all that together into a, a single platform. Um, why is it called Wayfinder? And Wayfinder, the word Wayfinder comes from um, the Polynesian culture of, of seafaring and, and people may or may not be familiar with this, but for, for thousands of years, literally for, for more than 3000 years and maybe as long as 5000 years, as Polynesians, the first Polynesians, or they weren't Polynesians then, they were later to become known as the Polynesians, but the first people moved out of Southeast Asia to inhabit the islands of the South Pacific. Um, they navigated enormous distances in these small boats as um, a replica of one there on the screen and they had no navigation instruments they had no maps to follow um, and at a time when Europeans couldn't leave uh, the safety of of um, the shore basically as Europeans um, navigated they kept the the shoreline in sight because they didn't have a chronometer uh, invented until much later these people, the, way, the wayfinders, the Polynesians, were exploring more than 10 million square miles of ocean, uh, an area from Rapa Nui across to the Hawaiian Islands and right down to New Zealand and inhabiting and colonising and inhabiting islands right throughout that whole chain. So on, a, on an incredible scale. And when we were starting to work on Wayfinder two years ago, we, we discussed how do we embody what we think is the most important challenge in the Anthropocene, mm -hmm. trying to navigate our way um, in uncharted waters? And we stumbled across this metaphor of the wayfinders and this idea that these people in these small boats were um, out and navigating areas that had been never been um, traversed by humans previously. And they did it by using a set of skills and they were able to develop skills about um, reading the signs around them, uh, the wind, the waves, the water, uh, the weather, the clouds, the, the sun, the moon, the stars, as well as wildlife. And they were able to read all those signs and integrate that information together to help them to understand where they were heading, but also where they'd been. And, we thought this was an incredibly powerful metaphor and we've we've come back to this metaphor again and again throughout the whole process, even while we've been developing this this approach, these this um, online platform. It's guided us. We've continually come back to this metaphor of of navigating in uncertainty and navigating in an unknown future. Uh, and we've used that again and again. And so we thought it was such a powerful metaphor that we'd actually give this platform that name. Um, and we really pay and acknowledge, pay respect and acknowledge the wayfinders and that wayfinding tradition. It's been an inspiration to us and, and our intention is that, that that metaphor is an inspiration to people who use the wayfinder platform in the future. And so, um, so we pay our respects to those wayfinders. It's, the tradition still continues today and so it's, a, it's an ancient culture and tradition but it's also one that's very alive and strong uh, in the Polynesian culture even today, so we pay our respects to that. Before we get into some detail, we'll hear from Ellen in a minute, but we just thought we'd show you a, a little quick 
video which um, introduces Wayfinder and then we'll, we'll get into some detail. See if I can get that playing. Yeah, there. Oh. Amid rapid global change, driving transformations towards a sustainable, safe, and just future is one of the biggest challenges and greatest opportunities of our time. There is a growing need for guidance on how to navigate towards futures that benefit both people and nature. Wayfinder is an online platform for resilience assessment, planning, and action. Drawing on the latest research and experience in the field, Wayfinder guides you through five practical phases, complete with tools, activity sheets, and illustrative cases to support you as you go. Wayfinder, a resilience guide for navigating towards sustainable futures. So just before we, we hear from you and we'll get into some detail, I just wanted to touch briefly on what's, what's the relationship between this platform and the work that the um, Resilience Mel Community of Practice does on a day-to-day -day basis. And I guess um, we, you know, we're very aware of the, the work and the interest around measuring resilience and making sure that we can demonstrate um, to donors, to communities, to governments, to all sorts of people, to our own organisations and to people on the ground, the, the benefits um, from investment or effort into to building resilience. And so we're very aware of that work and we've been involved in some of that work ourselves, obviously. And um, where we see Wayfinder fitting with that is that by working through a very structured process like Wayfinder provides, is that you'd identify the types of interventions uh, and from that the sort of indicators that you might be able to uh, assess and manage, uh, assess and um, and evaluate um, to, to report on etc that Wayfinder actually provides a very structured process for identifying those interventions and from that the indicators that you might use to measure that progress and so it's coming from it from the other end, if you like, I guess from where a lot of um, thinking in the resilience um, um, male community of practice is at, at the moment. But um, we sort of, I guess we were hoping to explore and use this opportunity to, to explore from people's perspective um, that are online now listening with us, but also at the upcoming um, conference in um, New Orleans in November, the um, uh, RML conference that we could explore and continue a conversation and exploring about the need for both of these perspectives, these ends of, if you like, of the process to sort of come together. We need to identify um, uh, the right sort of interventions and then we need to also be able to track and monitor the progress of those interventions in, um, and to be able to uh, learn from those interventions and, and come back and, and feed that learning back into the, the front end of this sort of process so that we continue to improve our targeting and programming around um, interventions from a resilience perspective. So we see a really strong relationship between the work that the, the RML community practice is trying to do and the sort of work that we do and we'd like to see that conversation continue. So please feel free to um, you know, keep in touch with us after this and we'd, we'd be um, happy to have ongoing conversations, but also if we can connect at the, the upcoming conference in, in um, New Orleans in November, that'd be a great opportunity to continue the conversation as well. Okay, that's enough introduction overview. I'd like to just introduce Elin. Elin's been the project lead and a driving force behind this, had the, the vision and the drive to bring all of this together and has been a, a um, a, a kind of an inspirational figure in the whole process of pulling all of this together and so she's the perfect person to um, overview and go through the detail of of the Wayfinder. Uh, if you've got, as I said earlier, if you've got questions please just um, pop them in the chat box and we'll keep track of those but we'll have a, a bit of time at the end for discussion and, and questions so um, please you know make sure you use that opportunity. Okay, Ellen, over to you. 
Thanks, Paul. Um, there. So, hi, everyone. Nice to meet you, virtually, at least. Um, in a nutshell, Wayfinder is a collaborative process for resilience assessment, planning, and action in social ecological systems. It represents what we see as the, the frontier in resilience and sustainability science that we have synthesized into a clear and coherent approach that specifically targets the challenge of transforming to sustainable, safe, and just development trajectories in this era, uh, the Anthropocene. And I'll come back to what that is in a second. Uh, Wayfinder is not a book, it's not a PDF, but it is, um, it's a process guide that exists on an online platform that's full of practical advice, tools, and hands-on guidance that, that will help development practitioners, policymakers, and other types of change, change makers navigate uh, deep uncertainty towards uh, a better future. So in this presentation, I'll start to give you a bit of the framing that we have used in Wayfinder, how, how we see the sustainability challenge of the 21st century. And I'll also talk a bit about Wayfinder's approach to tackling this challenge. And uh, with that in mind, then I'll move into the actual framework. I'll show you what it looks like. It has five faces and I'll give you uh, some taste of what they all contain. Um, before wrapping up and, and explaining a bit why we're actually very um, excited, both me and Paul and the entire team about the potential uh, for change that we believe that Wayfinder has. So starting with the framing, um, we live in the Anthropocene today, and this is the geological era of humans where, where we, the people on earth, ha we have become the major driving force of change on this planet. Um, and what we need to do is to identify development trajectories that are both, let's see, there's a missing sign there, there. The, the, identify development trajectories that are both safe in the sense that they respect uh, planetary boundaries for what the, the Earth system actually and the planet actually can take in terms of, for example, climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, and oceanic acidification. And at the same time, respecting um, uh, social boundaries for what can be uh, considered a good life. And uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this illustration already of the, of the donut, which it's called. Uh, and, and in Wayfinder, this is, uh, this is really a starting point for us. We see uh, trajectories of sustainable, safe and just development as only being possible within this quite limited space between the social boundaries and the planetary boundaries. So Wayfinder is about identifying such trajectories. Um, and the second thing here is um, uh, in Wayfinder is uh, around the, the, the importance of a biosphere-based approach to development. And this very simplistic illustration that you have here shows that biosphere it's really the foundation of societal and economical development and in Wayfinder, this fundamental contribution that the biosphere provides, this very thin la layer around planet Earth, that's really an entry point to, to you know, being successful in finding these sustainable, safe and just uh, development trajectories. And we, the way we take this on, is using resilience thinking and complexity thinking as a lens, as a theoretical lens to understand how we can find these and navigate towards these sustainable, safe and just development trajectories through this kind of biosphere based approach. And resilience thinking, as I'm sure many of you know, it draws on um, both complexity science and social ecological systems research. And um, it focuses on issues such as cross-scale interactions and how that, you know, shapes development trajectories. It focuses on um, social ecological linkages, dynamic change, non-linear change over time. And what it does and why it's so useful in this context is that it really looks beyond kind of the surface of events and try to get at the bottom and the root Pro, uh, causes of the sustainability problems that we face today. Uh, 
And this kind of approach then helps us not just to react to change, but actually be able to uh, shape change and transform. Um, so that's the framing. So resilience in Wayfinder is a very broad uh, theoretical entry point. Uh, we do not focus on resilience as a system property only, but it's a, a lens through which we approach this entire challenge of navigating towards sustainable, safe and just development trajectories. So that's, um, that's something around the framing. That's how we set up uh, and the problem and the way we approach it. Um, this is, of course, extremely complex. How do you find those trajectories? And we, there's a large body of literature out there. We have, um, um, we categorize the challenge as basically being one of adaptive or transformative change. Depending on how, how, how severe your problem is, you might need to adapt in your system or you, you might need to transform your system to, to find to move towards these, these sustainable trajectories. And adaptation, that reflects a form of change where you um, make smaller incremental changes on an existing development trajectory to make things slightly better on that path. Whereas transformation is actually something that's radically different. It is about changing system feedbacks enough so that the system starts moving onto a different development trajectory that will result in different kinds of you know, outcomes over time. So in Wayfinder, we, we approach the challenge of, of, of navigating towards sustainable, safe, and just development trajectories as a question of either adaptive or transformative change, depending on you know, how severe the problems are. And also, of course, what scale that you're operating at in the system, you might decide that your system or parts of your system is in need of adaptive change or transformative change. But regardless of where you end up there on that spectrum, uh, you need to remember that, or we all need to remember that neither adaptation nor transformation has an end point. This is a continuous process. You will never be done with it. And because of that, we need to maintain what we call in Wayfinder option space. That is the long-term capacity in the system to navigate change. Um, and, and, and this is really a key issue because, um, you know, while solving the problems we have today, we may, must make sure that we do not lock ourselves into trajectories that we can't escape from in the future so that we really... Uh, solve problems in a way today so that we can continue and solve problems in the future. And we call that uh, option space. And it basically reflects a number of choices that are still open to us in the future. And the, so many examples of why uh, or where, you know, what we thought was a sustainable solution in the past you know, soon turns out to be the opposite. So this is a key element in Wayfinder. And we, um, sorry, we operationalized the, the option space um, ID through a set of seven resilience dimensions. And I'll come back to these a little bit later, but we draw on the work here by Unzi Biggs and colleagues uh, who's developed um, a set of resilience principles that we have um, adapted to fit this, this framing. So to reiterate a little bit, uh, the, the challenge of, of navigating towards sustainable, safe and just development trajectories in Wayfinder is seen as a, you know, the challenge of um, adapting or transforming your system while maintaining option space as wide open as possible for the future. And, and this is, of course, you know, not an easy task to approach um, and... Um, there is much literature on this subject as well. How do, you, how do you approach that? How do you go about doing that work? We have boiled this down to three uh, essential elements that, that um, people need to consider to, to be able to come up with successful strategies. The first one is um, leverage points for systemic change. And these are places, locations in the system dynamics where a smaller change, a smaller strategic change, actually can have a fundamental impact on how the system develops its feedbacks. And then, of course, over time, also its development trajectory. The second key element here is agency. That reflects who in the system has the 
capacity to influence those leverage points. It could be a policymaker or a manager or, or individuals such as, you know, yourself. Um, and the third aspect here um, is the opportunity context. And the opportunity context, that reflects the larger um, context of social and institutional structures that may be more or less conducive to different types of change at different points in time. And these three aspects, leverage points, agency, and opportunity, they are really at the core of the Wayfinder because in the intersection of these, as you see here on, on, on the illustration, emerges what we in the Wayfinder call the change narrative. And the change narrative, that is a, it's a story. Uh, it's a narrative about how you believe change, might, uh, change towards sustainability might unfold in your system over time. Um, that throughout the Wayfinder process becomes increasingly substantiated and concrete. But, and this is very important, it never loses sight kind of of the inherent uncertainty of the Anthropocene and this kind of rapid uh, changes that we experience right now, which may mean that many of the more traditional theories of change, this linear ideas about change from A to, to B, how that happens, is actually not that relevant for, for navigating this type of deep uncertainty. So the change narrative is a central um, aspect of Wayfinder. And, and uh, I'll get back to that when I, we look at the actual faces, um, um, how we use that in, in different ways, in different uh, phases of the, of the process. So with this little theoretical introduction about the sa sustainable, safe, and just, the biosphere-based approaches, the complexity framing, and uh, the leverage points agency and opportunity. This is really the, the theoretical core um, insights around which Wayfinder builds. Then we'll move into the actual framework. And it looks something like this. So Wayfinder is a collaborative process for resilience assessment, planning, and action. And the focus is on social ecological systems. So that systems human environmental systems coupled so pe people living in a landscape somewhere it could be a rural landscape a semi-urban landscape or some sort of uh, at local to regional level a landscape where people have some sort of relations through the ecosystems around them either through the resources they use or through just the relations uh, they have with that environment and and and, and how they use that environment so Wayfinder has five phases and you work through these phases iteratively, which means that you, here it's presented as kind of, there is of course some sort of logic progression from phase one to five, but there is also quite a bit of reiteration that happens within the process itself. And the first phase is about building a coalition for change. And I think for those for those of you who are familiar with the Resilience uh, Alliance workbook, you'll recognize part of it, this, these phases, but part of it is also new. So in the first phase, building a coalition for change, I think that is one of the, the, the um, places where we have actually, with Wayfinder, substantially improved on, on, on what was there in the past. And this is about drawing together a committed and capable and legitimate team of people at different scales who can carry the change process forward and assure that it has a long-term positive impact. The second phase is about creating a shared understanding of the system, of what the system is. This, we call it the system identity. And here, what you do is that you, together with a wider group of sta st stakeholders, you articulate aspirations for the future in that system. What kind of sustainable future are you people wishing and hoping for? But what you also do here is that you describe the sustainability challenge at hand to really give the, the Wayfinder process at least some initial framing. Um, the third thing, um, the third phase is about exploring system dynamics. And here you really analyze how different components of the system interact across scales uh, to produce those sustainability challenges that, that, that are experienced in the system. So it's a 
more technical part of the of the analysis or of the process where you really dig deep into complex system dynamics. Phase four is about developing innovative strategies for change where you design either strategies for either adaptive or transformative change um, by focusing on these three issues that I mentioned earlier, leverage points, agency, and opportunity. And the fifth phase is, we call that learning your way forward. And it's about implementing those strategies that you've just signed through an ad, you know, learning by doing approach that will gradually help you to refine your understanding of the system and the starch then, of course, a new iteration of the Wayfinder cycle. So this is the overview of, um, of what the Wayfinder process is. And um, it has some important, uh, uh, you know, it, it rests on some important uh, fundamental insights and this graph represents one of them. And this is about the importance of both having a good process through which decisions are made and you know knowledge are, is generated, and a good uh, and a good uh, um, quality of, of a high quality of information and content within that that uh, process. Because only only with with those two 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 um, uh, issues uh, both considered, you actually have capacity to achieve change. So there is much, much research that shows that, that you, you, need, you need a process that's considered fair and legitimate and just and so on to be able to generate commitment to change and agency for change so that people actually believe in, in what's, what's being developed in this process and wants to be part of that change. So the process is really key for navigating towards a more sustainable future. But at the same time, uh, the content is equally important because, you know, if your insights into how the system works and these, you know, these more complex uh, cross-scale um, interactions of the Anthropocene, how they work, if you don't understand that, it's quite unlikely that you'll be able to navigate towards more sustainable future, no matter how fair and inclusive and just the process has been. So this is really a central, you know, a cornerstone for Wayfinder, I would say, balancing a well-designed process with a sound understanding of the system dyna dynamics um, and keeping that balance throughout the process uh, to really be able to enable change. And I see that the, in this illustration, the, the, you know, the title of the bottom axis has, uh, we've lost that somehow, but it's supposed to say uh, quality of information or the content that's elicited through the process. Ellen, uh, just, yeah. if I can just jump in, just sure. before we go any further, there's a question from Adriana here yeah. about um, how we sort of defining resilience, does Wayfinder help to define the resilience of what to what? Or is it more general resilience? Do you just want to talk a little bit about the idea of, you touched on it, but yeah. the way we think about general resilience as option space? Just Yeah, I might have been rushed through that slide a bit too quickly, I realised, because uh, I'm not exactly sure about the, the, the audience here and, and, and people obviously come from different backgrounds with different takes on resilience. But so, so, so basically, Wayfinder is based on resilience thinking, as I mentioned. It's an it's a it's a it's a perspective uh, that considers issues such as nonlinear change, um, cross scale dynamics, and it's applied in the in the context of sustainable development within the Anthropocene. That's kind of the broad theoretical entry point to it. Resilience. Um, Within, within this field is defined, as you, I'm sure you all know, as persistence, adaptability, and transformability. Persistence is not relevant for most systems in the Anthropocene. There is con constant change. And Wayfinder, therefore, focuses on adaptability and transformability of a social ecological system. And I think that has, uh, those things have often in the past been um, uh, regarded as uh, 
specific resilience, you know, depending on what the sustainability challenge in that system is, uh, you might uh, decide that your system either needs to adapt, you know, uh, incrementally change on a given path or transform, radically change to a different pathway. So we don't call it specific resilience here, but that's what has often been labeled in the past. We call it adaptive and transformative uh, change. I think that's more, you know, accurately describe what the challenge is about. But what we emphasize here is that while you navigate your system for, for either or or somewhere in between, uh, you need to maintain what we call option space. And option space would then relate to the more generic notion of or general notion of resilience, the overall capacity to handle all types of change over the long term. So, so that's how we dealt with it here. I think it's quite a step forward from how resilience is uh, being, being used in many, many, both academically and in many uh, practical um, um, contexts. And, and we've taken this step uh, on conscience uh, uh, in the Wayfinder team because we, we feel that much of this debate about what it actually means and, you know, uh, to what is it good, is it bad, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that is actually only confusing. It doesn't really help to advance practice for sustainable development. So, our uh, entry point here. But there are certain key elements within resilience as a property and resilience thinking as a broader lens that is super useful to you know approach and work with this challenge. And we have boiled it down, or we have reframed it in these, um, you know, uh, recoded it maybe in these terms, adaptive capacity, transformative capacity, while maintaining option space over time. So I hope that clarifies thing a little, uh, things a little bit. Paul. That makes sense, Adriana. I guess what Ilan's saying there is we're, we're dealing with both the traditional yeah. what, you know, of what to what, which is that specified resilience and particularly that is relevant when we're talking about leverage points. So that's where leverage points would come in. You're, you're doing, you're intervening somewhere in a known, in relation to a, a known um, issue or a known threat or a, a known driver. So that's that specified or known resilience. Um, and so you'd be acting at a particular leverage point to try and change that. And then the option space, which is about just maintaining that general capacity to um, deal with knowns and unknowns into the future. That's that's what we're referring to as option space. So it's a bit of a shift in language, but we think, well, we believe that's a more useful kind of language yeah. and way to think about it. So thanks, Helen. Yeah, good, great. Um, so I'll move on. So, so we were on, on, but thank you, Adriana, also for asking that question because it's a really key uh, a key element here to understand and, and carry with us uh, um, through this um, discussion. Okay, so uh, I was talking about the importance of balancing um, a high quality or good process with good content as the only way really to be able to navigate change because being just good at process or being just good at content is not enough to actually facilitate change. And I think if we're a bit self-critical, a resilience assessment in the past, uh, especially the workbook and so on, they have been really good at content, not paying enough attention on, to the process. Uh, whereas I think many other types of maybe the more development uh, processes oriented or that comes from the development sphere might have been actually very advanced when it comes to the process and making sure that it's representative and, and legitimate and so on. But might have lacked some of the, the 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 theoretical basis or the kind of complexity framing that is so critical to understand the Anthropocene challenges and to be able to drive any kind of change in this kind of world today, where local where development is no longer a local issue. There is no 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 areas on this planet that is just you know uh, can navigate change based on what happens internally within that system. But we're really it's a hyper connected world. So this is a, a you know a cornerstone, and another cornerstone is this one. So Wayfinder to be able to keep this balance, uh, Wayfinder um, while going through these these phases in the Wayfinder process, the user switches between three modes of thinking. 
And the first one is consultation. We have called that consultation data analysis, data collection and analysis. And this is basically where you try to understand who should be in the process and, and, and what do they know about the system? What are the data sources that we can draw? And what does this you know, mean for the, what can we say about how the system works, what the problems are and so on. But you move from that kind of more pragmatic uh, phase into a phase of evaluation and reflection uh, that you see here on the bottom. And this phase at the end of each, at the end, at the end, uh, this mode of thinking happens at the end of each phase where you, uh, through in a structured way, evaluate what you did, how well you did it, if the balance between process and content is right. Um, but what you also do then is to switch to what we call sense making. And that's a, a deeper mode of, of, of reflection where you really try to make sense of what you've learned about the system the social ecological system up until now, and what this means for the overall prospects, uh, prospects of navigating change. So Wayfinder is really, really emphasis, emphasizes the importance of reflexive practice. And that happens both on an individual level for the people involved in the process and uh, on a collective level in the coalition for change. So this kind of iteration between these modes of thinking, the, the consultation, data collection, and analysis, the evaluation, reflection, and the deep sense making is, um, is also a foundational um, kind of uh, aspect of how you work with the Wayfinder framework. So um, with that, I thought I'll, I'll give you uh, a little taste of what we have in the different what the different uh, phases contain. So the first one is about building a coalition for change, as I mentioned earlier. And, it's, and, and, and here it's really about bringing together a, a, the right people across scales to, to lead this process so that it will uh, make, so that you can make sure that it has a long-term sustained positive Im impact. And, here, important issues to think about when, when, when uh, putting together this coalition for changes of call is, is of course, representation, who needs to be represented on this, in this group, uh, but also issues such as skills uh, and, and, and capacity among those individual members. And there are, we have quite a lot of advice on that in, in Wayfinder, the kind of uh, the kind of tasks that these people need to be able to take on. And the third thing here is um, influence. How well connected are they and how, how, how able, you know, their agency in terms of being able to drive change in the system. So what they do here in the beginning of the process is to decide or agree on a set of ethical uh, principles and a moral compass for the overall Wayfinder process. They also design the process so that it, it's, it fits with local um, um, environmental uh, the, the situation and the context but also social context and traditions culture values and that sort of uh, things so to make sure that you have an appropriately designed process for the given context so wayfinder is a generic uh, process that you'll have to tailor then depending on where in the world you work at what scale and so on uh, you also discuss who should participate in this process wayfinder is a participatory and a collaborative process, as I mentioned, but, but there are important considerations to make about who should be involved in the process, when and in what way to make sure that it has this kind of sustained positive imp impact. Because, and there is often a balance to strike here between broad uh, participation, which is important for legit le legitimacy and, and other reasons as well, uh, and more, you know, focused participation and narrow strategic participation at different points in the process to really make sure that decisions are made and, 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 and so on. And there we have quite a bit of discussions about how to think about these trade-offs in terms of broad and strategic um, participation. Um, what you also do here in the first uh, phase, and this is important, is that you need to start building the capacity for systems thinking and reflexive uh, practice within the coalition, so that uh, coalition members individually become increasingly better uh, to understand complex systems and also to practice this mode of, of continuous reflection. And 
you discuss quite, uh, you know, focused in this first phase also within the coalition where where you are in the in the in, the, in relation to the system that you're trying to change. That's what this. Uh, little icon is supposed to illustrate here. Are you in the center of the system that you're trying to influence and change? Or are you in the periphery of it? How well connected is that coalition for change in relation to achieving what you set out to achieve? So that's the first phase. The second phase is about here, You, as I mentioned, you reach out to wider audience um, to collaboratively and jointly articulate um, and, and, and maybe work out the system's identity. And the first thing you do here is to um, uh, explore aspirations for the future. What, what, what do people want? What kind of future do people want in this system? Um, and you also look at system benefits. And we, we do this in, in Wayfinder through an ecosystem services lens. That's not, uh, you know, we're not prescriptive of that, about that. It's one way of doing it. But we look at bundles of services. That's what this little flower diagram illustrates. And how are different ecosystem services providing benefits to different groups of people in different ways? That's one way of looking at benefits and also trying to understand how that how that's, that has changed over time. And, you know, starting with that aspiration, moving through the benefits we land in, understanding the most pressing sustainability issues or challenges in, in the system. And in Wayfinder, we frame these as social ecological dilemmas. So that's kind of the local level or regional level expression of some sort of uh, global sustainability challenge, which often at, at, at that level take the form of a dilemma. It's about choices where you have people who benefit more and less from, from, from current state of affairs and development. So what you do here is that you really zoom in on, on, on what, you know, what are the problems of this system. And it's usually not one, it's a set of uh, uh, social ecological dilemmas. And what you also do is that in relation to these aspirations and the dilemmas, you try to understand what the system is try to identify system components, what are relevant scales of organization in, in, or you know, system scales in, in relation to those, um, to understand those dilemmas uh, and how is the system organized in terms of governance structures and so on. This is fairly you know, straightforward. Um, this has also been, this is a you know, part that's often, often um, included in resilience assessments in different way. Uh, it's important to, to do this well, though, so that it, it, you can describe the system and its boundaries in many, many different ways, but to make sure that you end up with some sort of um, usable systems model, you need to make sure that it really relates to the dilemmas that you're trying to solve and the aspirations that you're trying to reach so that you, you know, include the important cross-scale links, for example, not just focus on, on the local scale while drivers for the problems that you may have could come from completely different levels. And at, at the end of this second phase, you synthesize your knowledge up until now about the system into a conceptual model. And here, I don't, I'm not sure this shows where, well, actually it looks small now on my screen, but uh, what you have here are three different kinds of very basic conceptual models of what your system, social ecological system may look like. And that's of course different for different systems and contexts, which model is more you know, useful and it's not limited to these, you can use other ones as well. But you build such a conceptual model at the end of this phase, and you also start to draft this change narrative. How do people in the system envisage, envisage that change towards a more sustainable future could actually happen? Um, and this is very important here to kind of generate that commitment for change and emphasize the agency of people. It, it's not changing the system for someone else. It's, it's about people changing their own systems. Um, yeah, so that's phase two. And what this does is that it frames the process and gives it a provisional direction. I think what often happens later on in phase three and phase four is that this gets, you, you have to revisit this because as you learn more about the system and the problems, you realize that you hadn't included all the relevant variables or that there were actually other important, you know, networks to consider or scales, etc. But this gives a provisional, uh, you know, framing of the process and, and some direction. 
the third phase is the is uh, the more like the technical core element of the process. I would say, what you do here is that you try to understand how the system works. What are the system interactions and the feedbacks and the cross gay linkages and so on that creates those dilemmas and the problems that people the uh, people face? Why do they persist? So here you analyze issues such as thresholds and uh, trap dynamics. Um, and what, what you have here on, on, on the screen is just a very basic causal loop diagram uh, that shows how you can I, uh, you know, locate um, uh, the origin of a problem into the system dynamics. And there are different ways of doing this and you don't necessarily, in Wayfinder, we, we talk about many different ways of approaching uh, this challenge, but what you want to get that in this phase is some sort of systemic understanding and really the roots of those sustainability challenges that the system uh, faces. Um, so that's the first part of phase four is, uh, is systems, uh, 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 solid systems understanding. But what you also do here is that you start looking a bit more closely at option space. So this part relates to the specific problems, you know, that you, you um, asked about Adriana also how we looked at resilience. So this part uh, relates to the specific problems that you're facing, whereas what you also do is that you, you try to understand what, what constitute option space in your system. And option space, uh, as I mentioned, we operationalize these through seven uh, principles. Uh, the first one is foster biosphere stewardship and the culture of reciprocity. Uh, then we have encouraging learning and uh, um, reflexive practice. We have um, it's a, a building capacity for uh, complex systems thinking. Um, you see them here on the axis, but I see that it's, it's a bit small, maybe. Managing system feedbacks, managing cross-scale interactions and connectivity in the system, and managing social and ecological diversity and redundancy. But these are very then broad principles or you know categories of issues. And what you do in this in phase three here is you, you try to work out uh, you know, how these things apply to your systems, to your own system, which aspect of them are most relevant and so on and so forth. So you try to develop indicators for these uh, broad categories that make sense in your system and explore how they have changed over time. So you know what's happening with the option space. Is it, is it narrowing in or are you kind of managing to keep it reasonably open? And the last part of phase three is about starting to look towards the future. Where is your system heading? What are the major drivers for change acting on the system right now? And what are some of the emerging stressors and drivers that are, you know, maybe not quite that dominant yet, but are kind of lurking at the horizons? So, so you, you, you can do this in different ways, but for example, through some sort of scenario planning process where you start to look at what would be some plausible, possible, you know, development trajectories for your system over time. So that's phase three, understanding how the system behaves today, what the option space looks like and where the system might be, you know, heading if things continue the way they are. Um, sorry. Um, and then the next phase is about um, uh, designing innovative strategies for a change. And here um, we really emphasize the importance of innovation here. And the strategies uh, that we advocate for are, are strategies that really help people to reconnect to the ecosystems around them and foster this sense of, of, of um, stewardship um, and and um, and, and reciprocity also. And, and we focus on strategies that can target those deep leverage points for change. And, and we look at it through the leverage points is not the only thing, of course, we have agency and opportunity as well, but we start uh, with the perspective of leverage points and using the systems knowledge that you have just developed in the previous phase. Uh, here, you really get into 
deeply analyzing where where could we shift and 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 tweak system dynamics in a way that would sh- shape the system's tra- trajectory over time. Uh, having done that, you look at agency who can influence those leverage points and opportunities. W- what are the kind of opportunity context for that sort of, of, of change right now? Are there currently, you know, laws that are maybe prohibiting that sort of change or subsidies that make it difficult or or that sort of thing? And Or is there an upcoming policy window or something like that? That's the kind of thing that you look at here. We filter the actions for feasibility and effectiveness so that you make sure that only actions that are both feasible from an economic, environmental and a social aspect are, 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 are included and effectiveness to make sure that they would really be effective in terms of moving towards your goal. And then the last part here, and very importantly, is that you consider, you look at the actions for change that you have designed and you uh, look at it from a perspective of, of um, unintended consequences. You know, all interventions in complex systems will have a mul- multiple you know, consequences, some that you have expected, others that you have not. So what could, trying to foresee them, and then also trying to uh, understand something about the uncertainty around these, given the multiple development that might happen in your system in the future. And then also, of course, trying to consider how they influence option space. So, sorry, I'm just going to mute some. Um, additional sounds here. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, there. So that was that. And then moving into phase five. Um, So at the end of phase, I I should just say that before moving on. At the end of phase four, what you have here is you actually end up here with a a strategic action plan. And that consists of a number of actions and strategies that is designed to, to, to influence system dynamics so that they, your system will adapt or transform uh, towards the kind of future that that you have jointly um, articulated on as being something desirable in your system, more sustainable. And this is actually a concrete manifestation then of your change narrative. This is this is this is the the you know the, the kind of more at this point in the process it's structured and it's plausible enough to be tested in reality. But it's still something that is very uncertain, right? Because we don't know, we don't know how these in- interventions um, will affect the system in the end. And there's plenty of, of evidence for that, that we, that we don't. That the things that we do, the way we intervene in system have many unintended consequences. So what you do here, moving into phase five, it's really shifting your attention to, 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 to real-life implementation, but in a way that focuses on learning. Not just learning if you did what you said that you wanted to do, but learning to see if this moves you in the, roughly the right direction. So what, you, what, you, what we focused on here is really building this strong learning culture. You test your action strategies in a way that allows you to refine your system understanding and gradually learn more about the system in which you're working. And this starts then a new, uh, um, a new, a new iteration of the wafer in the process. And and you know this is not to say that monitoring and evaluation is not important. It's super important, and we have a big section on that also in Wayfinder. But it is embedded in this kind of deep learning framework. So make sure that you monitor and, and look at the, uh, and evaluate the right thing, not just for accountability, which is, of course, important, but only for making, also for making sure that you really, uh, that these kinds of interventions that you've designed is moving you in the desirable direction. So other issues included here are, of course, course you know small scale pilots and 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 testing them them in a in a safe way that will not cause harm to you know people in the system and another important part here is about scaling and embedding those innovations and new ideas into existing institutions to enable a, a wider uptake and spread of them so depending on your learn, what you learned here, as I said, this will start a new iteration of the Wayfinder cycle. And you'll, you'll, you, you, this, this, this doesn't have an end point, as I say, because uh, the, the challenge of navigating uh, towards 
a more sustainable future through adaptive or transformative change. It, it never ends. We'll never be done with the adaptation and then we can just leave it. But we'll gradually learn more about the system and be able to refine what we're doing or change it maybe completely if we got things wrong or if this, you know, the context has just changed. So that's the, that is Wayfinder. That's what the framework looks like. And I'm not going to go into this much at all. I'll just very briefly mention what um, that it sits on an online platform. You can check it out on wayfinder.earth. And it has a pedagogic introduction where we explain all these key concepts that I talked about today. The content is divided up across 40 work cards, and each of them has a specific how-to part. So it explains roughly how to approach that, that task. Um, we have quite a lot of activity sheets and discussion guides throughout this process also that will help people actually do the work. And there's a large number of cases um, and links also to that MOOC that Paul mentioned in the, in the introduction to help explain specific concepts and ideas. So I think um, it has a lot of, lots of practice uh, around this quite uh, theoretical uh, core that I've been uh, going through now. So just to end, uh, we think that all in all, this makes Wayfinder quite promising um, process guide. It, tar it really targets uh, the key challenge of our time, transforming towards sustainable development trajectories in the 21st century. And uh, there is a huge demand already now for resilience-based approach and, and a growing one. And what is unique about this is that this really integrates a wide range of new and relevant insights from the field of resilience thinking and sustainable development into one coherent framework and approach. So this stretches from you know, planetary boundaries to ecosystem services to distributed human well-being to uh, understanding the difference between adaptation and transformation and and understanding how human agency works in relation to institutional structures and that sort of thing. So, so there's a lot of new uh, theoretical insights that we've uh, included into this. But, and very importantly, I think, in, in contrast to many other, not all, all other, but many other resilience guides, this is also packed with practical advice on how to go about this, uh, to approach this work and this challenge. And then, just to end then, I, we really believe that there are no quick fixes that will help us solve the, 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 the enormous challenges that we face in the Anthropocene today. There will be no light touch approaches there. The, you know, there, it's not sufficient to, to target the kind of the depth of the sustainability problems that, that, that we face now. So achieving the kind of deep change that the world needs will require hard work. So, and Wayfinder is set up, I think, in a way that this balance between the complexity approach to the Anthropocene challenge with this very thorough process design and this emphasis on, on, on deep learning, um, that helps the user really navigate this kind of uncertainty and change through uh, uh, that sort of uh, deep process that is needed and and that's why we actually believe that this has some potential to to contribute to positive change and we're we just launched launched this last week at, at an event here at Stockholm Resilience Center and we're really excited now to see where it goes from here so yeah that's what I wanted to say and I'll hand back to you Paul right thanks Helen wow Whew. yeah that's a lot a lot of stuff there it's really but a fantastic overview, so thank you. Um, so we've got a few minutes for questions. I'm interested whether anyone's got any questions, any comments, just reflections on, on all I've heard there. And just while you're thinking, Ilan, there was a, a question that came in earlier, which was around um, thinking about how we validate different types of knowledges. Yeah. Um, in navigating a shared future and I was I was thinking about this question while you were talking and I mean to me there's sort of or four key things around how do we validate we know that there's always you know different knowledges involved and I was thinking that um, the first thing is to make sure you include those knowledges in the process so creating the space for those different knowledges to participate so different people holding different knowledge types and 
we've tried to emphasise that strongly that you need to have you know the full range of people involved if if there's um you know um, landowners and um uh you know scientists and government agency people or um, ngos you need all of those people around the table so you need to create and include those knowledges in the process the second thing i would say is that um, you should always try to look for multiple lines of evidence so not just relying on technical you know reports or or published research that you know local ecological knowledge technical ecological traditional ecological knowledge um, can be brought together with technical uh, information and and so using a, a sort of principle of saying you should always be trying to have multiple lines of of evidence different types of knowledge to validate and explore the third thing I'd say is that you need to be aware and categorise the different types of knowledge that, that you are using. So it's easy to get captured by one knowledge source or one, um, uh, you know, uh, type of expertise or um, the dominant voices or people that have more power in the system. Um, and so just being really careful to, to recognize the types of knowledge and to categorize those different types of knowledges to making sure that you are drawing on a range of different knowledge types and then the last thing i'd say is around this knowledge question is about getting a sort of um or validating different types of knowledge is that we shouldn't necessarily be trying to validate or invalidate but perhaps synthesize knowledge types so bringing together different forms of knowledge to create new shared understanding and, and it's that shared or joined understanding that you know creates that potential for um, uh, new opportunities or new insights into um, different um, uh, you know dimensions or different um, aspects of the system that just having that shared joint knowledge or bringing knowledge together to create a sort of new knowledge artifact if you like or a new knowledge way of um, looking at it that's where you get real opportunities for uh, new insights that you may not have had before. Um, yeah, so, can I jump in, Paul, and just add something to yeah, that? Please. Yeah, please. Yeah. No, and I think this is an essential issue about the knowledge, different kinds of knowledge systems and, and uh, the importance of respecting that. And, and there are, you know, one issue around representation and, 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 and that sort of thing related to this, that's of course very important. But, but another just very pragmatic uh, you know, answer to this question is that these are complex systems. No one fully understands how they work. We, we, it's, you know, we will never have a perfect understanding of, of, of these complex interactions. And by you know, contrasting multiple views, multiple perspectives, multiple ways of understanding, that really gives us a more, you know, um, a fuller understanding of the complexities we change. And, 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 you know, there is not necessarily one right way to describe the problems or, or they are multifaceted and so on. So, so this, you know, diversity of knowledges and diversity of perspectives is, is essential in the Wayfinder process to, 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 uh, to really get at this complexity. But that said, then there are also, part, you know, at different points in the process where you need convergence and where people need to agree on, you know, some some basics around why we do this, what the overarching, you know, aspirations for the future is, and so on. So, so it is really, you know, moving between divergence, understanding this, you know, broad spectrum of different perspectives, and then agreeing at certain key points in time about, you know some of the challenges and maybe some of the ways of addressing those challenges. But, but you know, that broad system does not need to be in full agreement all the time throughout the process. That's not realistic and it's not, um, it's not beneficial either. So it's managing this, you know, divergence and convergence with, through the process, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Um, Adriana, just your question about where's Wayfinder been applied? How did the users find the process? What were the outcomes? So, um, as Ellen mentioned, Wayfinder was only launched last week, so in this current form, so it, it hasn't it hasn't been applied in full by in its current form. But what we've had is um, we've had a pilot process running in parallel in Senegal with the Great Green Wall, 
um, work there. And I guess, um, and then we've got other pilots that are in the just getting started. Um, but I guess more broadly, most of the elements or different parts of this have been tested in different ways in different places. And I guess the overall message is, we, as Ella mentioned, you know, this is we're trying to make deep or complex um, deep change in these complex systems. And I guess everyone that engages with these types of tools and this type of process has similar reflections, which is, you know, this is not easy. And, and we're not kidding ourselves that this is an easy or simple process. This is, we're saying, this is a challenge. You, you have to engage deeply in this. It takes time, it takes effort. Um, but we think that that's really appropriate given the types of challenges that we face. Um, and the feedback consistently though, from you know, lots of different um, parts of this that have been tested in different ways in different processes is, done well, you always get new insights. That's the overwhelming thing that comes back to me again and again is if you put that effort in and if you use these concepts and these tools, you get new insights. So um, we consistently see people getting new insights into the problems they're trying to solve, even to relatively, you know, sort of old problems, if you like, so to well-known kind of problems that have been persistent or continue to be problems in lots of different systems around the world that if you apply these ideas and you you engage deeply in those um, with those concepts in a place you will get new insights and um, we've done quite a bit of survey work with a community of practice that we run here in Australia but also in other places where we've been working and you know the 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 feedback is always fairly similar, which is, this is hard, you know, this is a challenge, this is a lot of work, and some of the concepts are challenging to get your mind around, but that when you apply them, you do get those new insights. And so to me, that's reassuring. We, we don't know, you know, we're not pretending that Wayfinder is gonna change the world or that we don't know with 100% certainty that it'll work. But what we know is all of the different elements and different concepts in there and a lot of the practices have, um, uh, and it's, you know, we've got a lot of examples of using those different practices in different places is that they tend to work well. Um, but as I say, there's no certainty. We don't know that all this will work, you know, in every circumstance, et cetera, but we do know that you'll get new insights. So. Yeah. And, and, and as Paul started off saying, we really want to acknowledge the rich history on, you know, what, what this builds on uh, and, and um, much great resilience assessment and planning work going on there. So, you know, this is, I'm sure that you recognize many of, of the elements that I talked about today. What, I, what we believe is new, though, is the process as such, the, you know, the way we have put together these elements into a fairly structured and, and manageable, coherent process. Uh, and, and all of the things that we talk about here are, you know, documented in science and practice as being um, useful in their own right. But what, what I believe is the innovation with Wayfinder, it's the overall process, the coherent, the, the co coherent frame around it yeah yeah um adriana just uh, i mean again another really good comment that um and i agree you know i've been involved in lots of systems mapping it's it's usually a game changer but as you say it it often needs facilitation and or it you know it's often done by high, in through highly facilitated processes we one of the things we stress is this does need facilitation and it does need good skills in facilitation um, but we also think we've provided enough guidance and enough support around even some fairly simple system mapping type tools and and um, um, ways of understanding complexity and we think there's enough there to guide people that even even doing it alone without, you know, expert sort of systems facilitation that people should be able to develop new insights. And so it's better if you've got, if you've got that facilitation expertise, um, but 
um, we would hope that as long as you can run good process, that there's enough guidance here that'll help people to understand um, some of these concepts. So you need good facilitation skills. You need to be able to bring people together and run good processes, those sorts of things. But we think there's enough guidance both contained within this um, platform, but also outside too, there's, as you're probably aware, Adriana, there's so many new tools available, you know, to assist systems mapping. There's lots of good online tools now. There's lots of um, good facilitated guides that people can use. So we, we haven't, in a lot of places in the, in the Wayfinder, we've actually said, you know, we're not going to duplicate that information. There are lots of good things available online or good tools. Here's some examples. Um, go off and explore those. But it is a challenge and we really recognise that, that there is a challenge around facilitation and needing those facilitation skills and they're not always available. And so that's, that is a challenge. Yeah, and it's also, I think, um, I don't think this is like it will either work or it will not work. There is such a big gradient within, you know, it provided some change. Yeah, it made maybe a few people think differently. That's a change. That, that might be one step in a way. If you manage to get the good coalition for change together, that might, you know, that will of course increase the chances that Wayfinder will provide a more substantial outcome. But then there are so many other factors, of course, like, you know, ongoing global changes that might hamper the specific change that you want to uh, achieve in your system. So this is not a recipe, it's not a blueprint, and there is nothing like that. And we don't believe that that, that, that exists. But it is some sort of roadmap maybe of, of, of important issues to consider along the way. And the better you were able to do this for various reasons, like you have, you know, really skilled facilitation available, or you are really well positioned in your system in terms of your own agency and, and your networks, the better you, you know, you can, you're able to complete these different parts or, 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 or you know, cover these different important aspects. I think the more likelihood uh, you have to, to, to that Wayfinder will provide something um, yeah, some some more long term change and and substantial change, but but even without that, I think this kind of of, of of guided process will help the people that that are involved to think differently, and and that's not trivial. It is important to 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 this kind of, these insights about systems thinking and how found how foundational that is that we start to see things the world as being as connected as it is and, and problems, they're not sectorial. All of them are cross sectorial nowadays. So, and this kind of system thinking skills that Wayfinder is really strongly, um, you know, emphasizing throughout, uh, throughout th that is a benefit regardless of whether you, you know, you'd fail in phase four or something like that for, for reasons beyond your control. It will still have, you know, the different exercises and so on that you've done at until that point will still have, you know, helped you take a step in the right direction, I think. Hmm. Um, so a question from Peter. Um, I'm doing a project in Japan looking at how they are responding to the 2011 triple disaster. I can see the value of Wayfinder, but it, could, but it would not be taken up by a national government and there is too much path dependency now built in central government policy responses in its mm -hmm. equilibrium engineering led responses. So where's the entry point for Wayfinder in this context? Good good question, Peter. And yeah. um, I do a lot of work, you know, I do a lot of work with government uh, and government bodies and yeah. I think the, the, the hardest, the hardest groups, groups to work with are and when they're combined. I think that's a really challenging space. There tends to be a, a sort of um, this belief that we can engineer our way out of these problems or that we can use a sort of top down or centralized control sort of um, approach to kind of solving these sorts of problems. And what we see consistently is that they tend to fail or they run into problems. I would suggest that the entry point for that is actually at the local level. So, um, working with local people, uh, you know, right down at the community level, people who will be affected by 
those engineering kind of responses, actually engaging with them about what do they want for their future? Do they want engineering solutions to these, um, to these challenges? Do they want that to be dictated to them by someone you know, outside of their immediate context? Do they want to be directed and told what to do? Um, and if there is an opportunity to start those conversations at the community level and um, exploring with people about what's, how are these decisions being made and is that the best way? Are, are decisions made in, in Tokyo or you know, wherever the regional government is or whatever, is that the best place for those decisions to be made in relation to local concerns and in relation to the local landscape and the values that people hold locally? And so it's very difficult to do and, and in some ways, you know, in some places that's not possible. You don't have access to the local community. But if you do, I would suggest starting a conversation like that and, and using some of the earlier parts, the earlier phases of Wayfind here about community aspirations, thinking about power, thinking about where decisions are made, et cetera, in phase one and two could be really useful at that community level. Uh, um, I, and I'd also suggest that the other thing is finding a person in government. Yeah. So finding that, you know, that person who is looking for a different approach. So, and again, you know, that's sometimes hard, but sometimes just a chance conversation or a, um, you know, you recognise in the way someone's talking that they're actually looking for a different approach or looking for other ways to think about these problems. People that have been involved in trying to do it in the past through a kind of top-down command and control or a centralised approach, recognising that that hasn't worked and they're trying to do something different. And so often it's about finding a toehold, you know, one person to start the government and that can be the way in, but, but not easy. And, you know, like I say, I think that's the kind of worst combination is centralised government um, and engineering that combination is a, is a real challenge. Yeah, and, and I think um, th this kind of efficiency paradigm is extremely dominant. And it's something that uh, like people who are thinking more, uh, um, you know, using a complexity framing are constantly struggling with, um, that it is actually not efficient with this kind of efficiency approach to these wicked problems. It's not so, I, and I'm sure you've seen that in Japan, uh, Peter, that that the kind of command and control and efficiency, you know, it, it doesn't work in, 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 in context of deep uncertainty, which the world is experiencing right now. So I think what Paul said, I, I completely agree and, and just want to emphasize that Wayfinder is not just a local process, but it's really about taking that as a starting point, but connecting to processes above um, um, to the appropriate decision making structures and so on and making sure these are on board, for example, through the, you know, um, uh, the coalition. But for change, but then it's a matter of finding that key individual, and 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 because of this, um, the, the dominance of this efficiency paradigm that will, and the idea that will find a solution and then will solve the problem, and then you know it will be solved and over and done with, that is so dominant across society, all sectors. I think very entrenched still in the development sector. Uh, because of that, I think a challenge for us right now is really to find the the you know the. Uh, couple of percent maybe of the projects and so on that are ready for this kind of more complexity based long-term um, approach that, 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 that has such a different entry point in how, in how you believe change and how we believe change happens in systems and to find those you know identify those key individuals or organizations or communities that are ready that that see that you know the old ways, they don't work any longer and we need these new approaches and that they're willing to take it on, have the resources, have the time and the capacity in terms of leadership and, 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 and all of that. So I think that's what we're really looking forward to now, me and Paul and the Wayfinder team to, to get deeply engaged in a couple of, of um, pilots where we explore jointly with people on the ground how, how this may work. 
Thanks, Ellen. So we're almost out of time. If there's any other questions now, we've got one more minute if there's any other questions, but um, if not, we'll start to wrap up. And I just want to, I guess, thanks, thank you for making your time available to, to join us. Um, as Ellen said, Wayfinder is now launched. It's out in the wild um, and you can find it there at um, wayfinder.earth. Um, we're, we're looking to um, continue the conversation and Peter, yes, we are going to, I was just going to mention the, the Resilience Measurement Evidence and Learning Conference. It'll be on in New Orleans in November 12 to 15 and um, myself and Alison Quinlan from the, the um, core team of Wayfinder will be in New Orleans. So um, it'd be great that we'll, we're going to be running some sessions there and there'll be some opportunities to continue the conversation. So um, if you're going to be there, that would be great. If you could make contact um, before or, or when we're there, that's a great opportunity. So, And, right, and maybe, thanks, just, maybe just one, one final thing for me. Uh, we um, we don't see this as the final thing. It's done. <laughs> there will not be any, any follow-ups, but we, we see Wayfinder as a work in progress that we will continue to work on and develop in concert with practice. So, you know, your practical experience of this will be well received and we encourage, you know, people to use this and to come back with us, to us with their experiences and comments and help us to improve this over the, you know, coming years together. Okay, great. Thanks for your time uh, and hopefully we can stay connected. We'll look forward to catching up with those people that are in New Orleans in November. Uh, feel free to follow up. There's a, a website, uh, there's an email address, sorry, um, in Wayfinder. So if you want to contact us, you can just email through that, um, that email address on the site itself and that will come through to us. Uh, so that we can stay in contact if you've got follow-up questions or if there's opportunities to think about um, what we can do uh, in the future to continue this kind of learning journey. As Elin said, we don't see this as the last, um, you know, step in this. This is just another link in a very long chain. So we're all looking forward to learning together. Okay, if we're all done, we'll sign off. Say so thank you to Elin for all of your efforts. Elin, well done. Uh, and. Um, thank you, Paul, for moderating, <laughs> keeping it together. Yep. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Got some runner recording in. Oh. House. House. Also.